Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb! Drop the bomb! We're gonna drop the bomb! This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Sound Bombing. Wherever you're listening to Sound Bombing Communities, I'm so excited that you decided to join me today in the bomb shelter because as Jay-Z said, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you decided to hang out with me, not because you heard I'm an amazing guy. Well, maybe you did, but I think that you're here because you heard or you've been here before and you know that we have some of the most amazing guests who decided to join me in the bomb show to, to share some of the amazing things that they're doing, not just to celebrate themselves, but to give you some strategies, some life hacks and brain hacks to give you some strategies because these people that I bring on to my show, they are, they are high performers, just like our last guest, you know, our last guest brought it to us. And so again, we always want to bring the energy, but if you're new to sound bombing, community, sit back and relax. If you old, I already know what you're doing. You got your feet on the floor. You got your palms facing up. If you knew, why am I doing that? Because to, when, before we start our show, we like to do our three breaths. That creates the foundation for the show. We like to clear the space because I don't know what type of energy you bring in across these virtual airways and you don't know, you don't know what type of energy I'm bringing, but typically the energy that I bring Typically, the energy that I bring is going to be positive because I like to keep it positive, and that's what we do. So if you're, if you're new, put your feet on the floor, palms facing up. As my third graders used to say to me years ago, they would say, sit up, sit back, roll your shoulders back, and relax, and we're going to do our three breaths. Our first breath, we're going to go deep inhale. We're going to hold it for three seconds, and then exhale. We go a little deeper on the second one, inhale. Hold it for three seconds, exhale. Last one, we go much deeper, inhale. Hold it for five seconds, exhale. Bombers, what is that called? That is called the breath of life. And so what that says is that you are here and we are happy that you're here. We wanna thank you for listening to us. Thank you for all the amazing comments. Thank you for all of the, the opportunities that you share with me about suggesting some of the amazing guests we brought into this show. I don't have enough time to name them, but thank you, thank you. And if you have not left a comment, go and leave a comment. We're on every platform that you can think of. Every platform that exists, we are out there. So let's get down to it. Adversity is a normal part of life. You all know that. However, it doesn't need to be a negative experience. In fact, dealing with adversity can become a very positive and nourishing experience that can lead to a monumental growth and development. The problem with adversity is that most people never see it in a positive light. In many instances, adversity provides us with an opportunity to learn some tough lessons. Do you hear what I mean? Tough lessons that can help us improve our life experiences and also our circumstances to allow us to move forward. However, in order to see adversity in this way, we must first acknowledge some of the truths that might initially be a little difficult to stomach. We have to really, really look inside of ourselves to see how did we get to where we are. We always have the freedom to choose how we respond to people, events, and circumstances when facing adversity. We can respond in a negative or limiting way, or we can choose to respond in more an optimal and productive way that can be potentially an opportunity to open other doors of opportunity that we weren't even aware before they had existed. So how do you handle adversity? 
How we handle adversity has nothing to do with what happens to us, but rather everything to do with the kind of person that we are in this situation. What no one knows adversity better than our next guest, Sean Harper. And despite the number of adversities he's faced, he will tell you that winners focus on what they're going to, not what they're going through. Did you hear what I said? Winners focus on what they're going to and not what they're going through. Who is Sean Harper? I'm so glad that you asked. And when you see the background, you're going to probably know who I'm talking about. Sean is a former NFL offensive lineman who played football for seven seasons with the Rams, the Oilers, the Colts, and the NFL Europe since 2004. He has owned and operated American Services and Protection, a growing multi-million dollar security agency service headquartered in the Columbus, Ohio area. He uses many of the powerful lessons he learned in football and strategically applies them in running his company. Get it? Running his company like running the plays that he did on the field. As a gifted national motivational speaker, he has inspired countless people all over the country uh, from the goodwill industries to play to win by harnessing the vision and mindset and strategies of teamwork. He, his book, his brand new book, The, po the Winning Edge, outlines his personal journey of overcoming obstacles. So put on your helmets, put on your knee pads, put on your full body gear, because my man, former NFL, MNFL player, Sean Harper is joining me in the bomb shelter. How are you doing, brother? Good yeah, afternoon. <laughs> Dude, I'm doing absolutely wonderful. So listen, I need to just carry you around wherever <laughs> I go, right? <laughs> Whenever I walk into a room, I'm like, hit it. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. That was awesome. No, you know, we only take what's given to us. And brother, I want to acknowledge the great things that you're doing on and off the field. I want to thank you for your years uh, being in the NFL, man. I, I played high school football, brother. After a couple of hits, I was done. I know you've been getting hit your whole life and you've been hitting people your yeah. whole life. And it's, I'm sure it's prepared you for the amazing work that you're doing. So as I can see, you got the background of the Indianapolis Colts back there. Let our listeners know first two things. How are you doing in this pandemic, and where are you calling in from? Well, I'm doing great, actually. Um, I'm, I'm learning how to fight a new fight. And so my motto is, you know, if life is a game, you play to win. And so I'm just retooling and I'm re-strategizing. And sometimes you throw haymakers and sometimes you throw jabs. Um, I'm calling in from, uh, uh, as you uh, mentioned, my office. Uh, this is one of my uh, offices in the, the north side of Columbus, Ohio. So I'm a native black guy and went to college at IU. So yeah, th this is awesome. So it's interesting, Sean. I, right before you, we uh, got on the call together in the studio, my old roommate, who's from Cleveland, Ohio, just texted me and she lives in Columbus, Ohio. She's a professor at the Ohio State, man, just like really? literally before you called and I guess there was something that happened in this area and she saw something on CNN and she was like, well, let me reach out to you. So how ironic, she's in Columbus, you're in Columbus, but you're here with me today, man. I'm so grateful and honored. I know you have a busy, busy schedule and I'm so glad that you decided to join me in the bomb shelter, man. Before we get into Sean on a football field and now Sean traveling all over the country with his security company. I want to talk to you about adversity at a very young age, man. I know from reading about you and what was shared with me, your life has been filled with adversity. Can you tell us about your childhood and some of the struggles and obstacles that you overcame to become who you are right now? Yeah, so so growing up, I was, I was challenged in just about every way, in every arena. Um, my mom scrubbed floors for a living. Uh, she raised all six of us by herself. Uh, by herself. My father left when I was about four years of age. Uh, repeating the first grade was very traumatic for me. Just just standing in the second grade line the first day of school and, and you know, you know, all the kids are having a good time and the teacher walks up and she grabs my hand and she pulls me back in the first grade line. And then the friends begin to tease me every single day. Shine, you fail. Shine, you're stupid. Shine, you're dumb. Even some of the teachers, although they, of course, they make no comments, but their expectations of me dropped. And I'm going to tell you right now, if I could just have just a, you know, ADD moment, you know, always manage your expectations of yourself and the people around you. It's like Wi-Fi, right? And so I went off to the fifth grade and um, I was struggling. I was struggling every day. You know, my greatest fear outside of a meal 
was being called on to either speak or to write or to spell. I would actually count the number of paragraphs uh, and, and the number of students. And so I know that my paragraph, paragraph number eight, I would get every word right, but I didn't because I, st I stuttered my entire life. And uh, um, uh, I ended up getting kicked out of a couple of schools because of disciplinary issues. Uh, I, I left high school with a 1.62 accumulative GPA, not on my ACT. Out of 154 seniors to graduate, my academic ranking was 154. And athletically, I barely started in high school football. I wasn't even honorable mention or conference. Now I'm mentioning this not because of the physical change, but because of the mental change. And oftentimes when you go through periods of adversity and you go through struggles, that the physical change metamorphosize themselves into mental changes. Well, it happens vice versa, but whatever it is, the mental is always stronger than the physical. And I'm not able to break out. I'm not able to move forward. And I knew there was something great in me. Because there was one or two people that saw the king and the kid. Like my mom would always say, son, you can make it. You know, one day you're going to do great things. And, you know, maybe that was mom. Maybe that wasn't. But I kind of hung on to those words. And then I get a phone call that kind of changed my life. I get a phone call from a junior college in Mason City, Iowa. Now, I'm from the south side of Columbus. I'm from the hood, right? And they're asking me to go to Mason City, Iowa, like 26,000 blonde hair, blue eyes. Everyone's last name is Schneider. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the cornfields. But it was amazing. The first year at that junior college, I set the bench the entire season. Not one play. And I picked up the phone and I called my mom. I said, Mom, I quit. I'm done. I want to come home. And I know there's people out there that, that you know, kind of felt like quitting. And my mom encouraged me, you know, son, you know, you can do it. And they give me the great speech. And so I go back or I actually go back early. And at that moment, that moment, I realized that I, could, that I would probably never be successful in life. But I can win in life. Success, you know, you have to go to great schools, great education, the great network, maybe the best skin, you know, skin or whatever, uh, skin color and all, you know. But 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 winning is something totally different. Winning is the fullest man uh, the fullest manifestation of who you are mentally, spiritually, socially, economically, and legacy. Most important, importantly, legacy. And so once I made up my mind that I'm a winner and I can win, then I begin to MacGyver life, and I begin to see opportunities the average person would kind of look over. I would kind of see ways that I can kind of fit into that crevice. In other words, get in where you fit in and I can win in that. And, and I started to stack wins on top of wins to the point that people would look at me and some even said, you are not supposed to be here. How did you get here? I'm, I'm standing next to you. I'm standing next to you, Allstate. I'm standing next to you, All-American. How did you get here? I'm a guy with life and I played the game to win. So I, I love the story of MacGyver. For those we don't have time, you got to Google yeah. MacGyver if you don't know what we're talking about. We don't have you. Why you googling MacGyver? Google the Dukes of Hazard. Google the A Team. Google Spencer for Hire. We don't have time to uh, to go through that right, right now. But I love how you lifted your mother up in that process, raising six of you all. But I want to go back for a second because I am I'm picturing Sean in the first grade, and what I know about you from our research is that. You discovered that you had several, you know, several learning disabilities, not just one. You had every label that could be, that can almost be given to a child and you still made it out. Let's talk about those labels. Let's talk about what your mother put inside of you that made you say that I don't care what those labels say about you, Sean, you're going to be different. Because I love when you made the statement, I have to write it down, man. You said there's a king in that kid. Man, I, if I was Oprah, I would say that's a that's a tweetable moment. When you, you watch Oprah, <laughs> so I want to be Oprah today. Yeah, okay. a, there is a king in that kid. So talk to me about these learning disabilities because as an educator who works with kids all over the country, oh, who have my own children, cool. and I'm in school, I'm in 100 schools a year. Well, I'm not in anybody's school now, physically, but virtually. I'm picturing Sean in the hallway, you know, being pulled out. I'm picturing you know, all of these different abilities. Some people call them disabilities. And I'm picturing your mama coming up there saying, listen, baby, I don't care what they say about you. You are, there's a king inside of that kid. 
That's Let's talk about those learning disabilities sure. for those parents out there that are listening who think that their kid cannot end up where you are. And then let's talk about what else did your mother put inside of you that mm -hmm. was my, that might have been different, let's say, from the five other children that lived in the same house with you. So, so one day, Miss Jennings, well, Mrs. Jennings, God bless her, loved my fifth grade teacher. Uh, she, she saw me struggle. Like, she would call me to the board and, and, or to read out loud. And, you know, you know she was extremely worried. And she uh, scheduled an appointment and I went to the office and in this room, there's a psychologist, a sociologist, all the ologists, right? They're all in this room, right? And they sat me down and I began to take tests for like three to four days. I'm just shapes and this and blah, blah, and read this out loud, read this backwards. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and it was amazing because when he pulled the results, he's like, I need to see your mother immediately. And a few days later, my mom came in a couple of days later and said, Miss Harper, your son has four to five documented learning disabilities. And then the whole narrative changed. We need to do this and we got to put him in this class and blah, blah. We have a whole system. And it's like it's like a Pandora box of systems opened up. And they're like, wow, we're going to prescribe and they're going to call this person from the city and state. And my mom stood up like, no, no, no. I'm just like, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm looking at mom. She's like, you, you will not label my boy. Think about that. Because you can never grow past your name. You will not label my boy. So he's going to struggle. Well, she didn't say it like that, but she said, he, he is going to be fine. We'll take the tutors here and there. He's not leaving the classroom. He'll be fine. And she worked with me. She yelled at me. She pressured me. She pushed me to the point that I'm having the pressure from school, that I'm having the pressure at home, and it forced me to, 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 to look at education differently. It forced me to um, um, uh, do alternative things to achieve the same grades that the normal students would achieve. Sometimes I had to bring a tape recorder to class. Sometimes I had to stay up and sing my notes. I would sing them or I would have a song playing in the background and I would sing with the songs, you know, just so I could remember the words to get the, you know, the notes over to the right side of the brain now that 20, now I'm looking back over years later or just whatever I had to do. But she did not allow the system to handicap and victimize me. And with that being said, I no longer see myself as disabled. That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. I see myself as uniquely enabled, that everyone has strengths and everyone has weaknesses. But if you focus on your weakness, then you can never move in your strength. I mean, every superhero has a weakness. Every superhero has a strength. But you don't hear freaking Superman like, oh, my God, there's kryptonite. <laughs> And Lois Lane. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, there's Lois and then there's Kryptonite. You know? No, it's like, hey, get it out the way for I can handle my business. Bam. And so that's how, even to this day, you know, I have multiple assistants. I have people around me. And I just focus on the one or two or three things I can do very well. So all of that sort of helped you carry over into your football career, but you still were faced with challenges because you said that there was a point when you were in junior college where you were like, I want to walk off the field. I want to leave. I want to just give up. What was the turning point right then or later the faith that you had within yourself to say that you can sort of work through, through the situation? When I started seeing myself as I truly am, I'm a winner. And so now that I'm a winner, I'm looking at life differently. And I can remember before I went back to junior college, I went back to junior college in May of that year. Mm -hmm. School starts in September, late August. Camp starts the first week in August. I'm back there in May because winners are different. Winners train different. When I started, okay, winner, okay, okay, this is what winners do. Success is totally different. Success is not static. Success is a man-made construct. Winners do things differently. Winners are intentional. So I went back to, I got on the Greyhound bus, kissed mama goodbye, had a thing of spaghetti, went back to junior college in a dorm room by myself. And I said, there's five or 600 junior college offensive linemen coming out. I said, what's going to separate you? I'm going to train now. 
and I trained every day, twice a day. I jumped 2,000 skips every single day, jumping rope, training, going through my the, the drills. The coach snuck me to playbook because I could never remember plays, right? So he snuck me to playbook, going through the plays. And, and then I started taking summer courses. And in the fall, I did something else different. I took 22 credit hours in one semester. I had night class every day of the week. It was crazy. But I wanted to separate myself and graduate early. So I went from not playing the first year to the second year being inducted into the Junior College Hall of Fame, getting a full scholarship to Indiana University, voted first team all region. It's the same person, but I saw myself in a different light. And I'm going to tell you something. The secret to this game really is how you see you. Forget how they see you. It's how you see you. All actions stem from thoughts. All thoughts come from beliefs, but your belief is nestled with what's called your self-concept. Who are you, victim or victor? I'm so glad that you said that, victim or victor. Um, did, was there ever a point in your life where you felt like a victim? And the reason why I'm asking that question is because not only did you have these learning disabilities, you wanted to give up, you had a major injury. And I'm thinking about this generation exists right now, and not even just young people. You know, I'm saying people in general, where we have this victim mentality, what message do you have for individuals who are constantly saying, oh, woe is me, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm not married, I'm poor, my mother is from another country, my dad is incarcerated, I'm, too, I'm, I'm caught up with the twos. Ray Lewis, when I got a chance to work with Ray Lewis, I love that he talked about caught up with the twos, too short, too lazy, too this, too that. What do you, what do you have, what message do you have for those individuals who are caught up with the twos and who are constantly staying in this victim mentality? Well, um, the secret is your focus. You know when you're in neutral. Oh, God, neutral's horrible. You, you know when you're in neutral because of your thoughts and your words. When you begin to say things like, man, how come, or this is what they did to me, or this and this, that's when, that's when you're neutral. And you can have all the ability and potential and the strength, and the engine could be a 351 Cleveland and a Mustang, man. Or it could be a Hemi. But if your car is in neutral because you see yourself as a victim, then guess what? You're, you're nothing. A 10-year-old could push you because you're nothing. You got to get your car out of neutral and get it in drive. If you got to put it in one first, you got to put it in two first, but eventually you got to put it in drive and you put it in drive with your focus. You always look to what you're going to, not what you're going through, and you fight for your focus and you never allow life to steal your focus. The death of the dream is stealing a focus and stealing of time. You, you fight for those two. You fight for those two. So your right. dream, so your dream was fulfilled because you ended up in the NFL, NFL. Yeah. And that's a dream that almost every little boy on the sand lot, in the ghettos, the barrios, the neighborhoods, the, the country clubs, the fields that they work hard to to get. And what people don't realize, very few people make it to the big leagues, be it the Major League Baseball, the NBA, or NFL. Walk us through that experience when you were playing in an NFL, and then how then did you transition from being an NFL athlete to then becoming a motivational or inspirational speaker? And, and how were you using some of the things that you learned in an NFL to then now motivate people all over the country? So, so my NFL career was plagued with, with with um, injuries. And I was very upset, I was very hurt and broken by that because it's like, you know what? I wanna get to the next level. I wanna, you know, maybe make all pro. I wanna get multiple, you know, I'm gonna retire in your Belinda in California off the 57 freeway. I mean, I already got it mapped out right. I'm gonna do that. And these injuries kept hitting things that I cannot, could not control. And you have to be at, you have to be at peace with the process, okay? You have to fight like heck, but at the same time, you have to learn how to be at peace in the process, okay? Be at peace in the pain. Move yourself to the eye of the storm and, 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 and you see things totally different. 
They say, you see things happening around you, but you have the peace that's within you because the peace is up there, obviously. But I'm gonna tell you something, moving through that process of the NFL and, you know, you know, I played, I had, you know, some opportunities out there. It was cool. Transitioning to the business world was a, was, was probably one of my biggest challenges. Let me back up for a second. As a motivational speaker, well, let me back up a little bit, uh, a little more. I had some of the, I had some of the baddest mentors when I played football ever. I had guys like Jackie Slater. I had guys like, Duval. I had people like Marshall around me. I had Tom Newberry. I had Bruce Matthews at uh, Houston. I had, I had dogs around me and they taught me so much to be in a locker room with 45 to 50 men and they're like some at different phases of their life and you're just listening. There's a guy named Mike Pagel and he would make me come sit next to him every other day and he had a director's chair and he would open up his newspaper. And he wouldn't say a word to me. I'd just sit there and for five minutes, he's just reading his paper. He'll stop and be like, you got knocked on your butt yesterday, but I saw you get <laughs> back up and do this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. Next time, do a little bit more here. Now get out of here. You know, it's just, it's just that type of leadership. It was an amazing experience. Now getting to the speaking aspect, every NFL team on the off season, they would allow players and during the season to maybe do speaking engagements because the community wants you know the players to come speak and i would all right hey i'll go and then i would go speak and every team i just kept speaking and you know and and i and i loved it and uh when i retired from the nfl the speaking engagements kept rolling in and i just kept moving with it and in reference to the company that was a hard transition but i realized that at the at the C-suite level, it's the same. It's win. It's win. So you have to think like a winner. So one of the things they did in the NFL, we would study players. We would study teams and players. We would know everything about that person. You mentioned Ray Lewis. Okay, we. If I was going up against Ray Lewis, I would know everything about Ray Lewis and his tendencies. But when I get to corporate, we don't do that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I know everything. I know everything about my competitor. I sit and I watch and I study my competitor, so I can find my edge. Things like that. So it's been a it's been a very different different transition from football to then motivational speaker and then sort of starting starting your business. What are some of the things that you carried over? Uh, from the football field. So one of them you said is really learning the competitors because as you, as you said in the business world, people are not studying their competition. Why don't you think businesses are doing that like they would do? Because you all study film. You study right. film, you study every move. Like I just watched um, the, the, the documentary about my, my, my Chicago Bulls, man, The Last Dance. And I remember just watching them. They had to, you know, the Pistons had a play about Michael Jordan. Like they studied, studied, studied. Why don't you think businesses are doing that? Because businesses are built on a, on a success model. And the success model, they prescribe, okay, here, you got to work hard. These are your goals. These are your benchmarks and blah, blah, blah. And so they put you in a, in a stable and they say, go. A success model is like swimming in, the, in a big swimming pool. A win model is like swimming in the ocean. And you're in the ocean, baby. And you, you need to know if that fish 20 yards away, is it a dolphin or is it a shark? You, you need to, your, your head's on a swivel. Your mindset's totally different. You're always looking for the edge. Now, here's the dichotomy. At the C-suite level, they teach winning. You know, did you make your numbers? Did you not make your numbers? Here's what's going on here. Hey, how can we get the edge? You know, how can we get market share? But everyone else they teach success to. And it's, and it's crazy. After middle management, it's all built upon success. And I'll prove to you at the C-level that that's what they talk about. The CEO and the CFO, guess what? When they get hired on, the second number that's negotiated after their salary is what, what's my severance? <laughs> because yeah. that's my win. It's like, guess what? I don't care. Okay, guess what? If we don't make our numbers. Okay, and you want to buy out my contracts? It's going to cost you $21 million. I'm going to win regardless. 
Well, I noticed that winning is in your vocabulary. Winning is all over the place. I know you wrote a book called The Winning Edge. What are some things that my listeners can do today to win, to win in life, to win in business, to win in relationship? What are some specific things, some very simple things that that we can do right now? So one of the things that I've learned is that I break rules and I never break laws. I I never, I never break spiritual laws. Spiritual laws will break you. And once you know the law, then you know how to move from the law or profit from a law. An airplane is flying because it's just a bunch of laws that, that we were able to learn and master. So once I begin to learn laws, I begin to master them. So I'll give you a law, the law of capacity. And it's like, you can only grow to the proportion of your environment. And sometimes you have to enlarge your environment. You have to enlarge areas of your environment if you want growth. When they build a skyscraper, before they build up, they build down. They build, you have to build in your capacity. Walt Disney had to build his capacity when he built Disney World versus Disneyland. He still got acres he hadn't even used yet, and he's dead. But he has the capacity for growth. You have to create and build your capacity, okay? That is a spiritual law. Okay, the second law is that you have to, it's called the law of agreement. When two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. One can send a thousand, two can send two thousand, ten thousand. So what you have to do is you have to be effective at building teams. You have to build team. You cannot think of a very successful man or woman without looking at their team. You think of, well, Bill Gates. Well, who's Paul Allen? Team. You think uh, um, um, Warren Buffett, who's, who's, partner Charlie. Hey, Mick Jagger. Well, who's Keith Richards? James Brown. Who's Macy O. Parker? Who's Fred Wesley? You know what I'm saying? It's like George Clinton. Who's Hampton? You you, you always have to have a team. And just because you don't see the teammate doesn't mean that the teammate's not there. A lot of entrepreneurs, what they try to do is they try to take on the world and build this thing on their own. And you can't because you're not built for that we are built for teams that are weaknesses, like a puzzle, a weakness is an indent, and you look for someone else that is compatible, and then you become teammates, and then you take over the world. Build teams. I love it. Speaking of teams, we're going to go from teams to teens, because I know that you were featured on an episode of MTV's Made, where that? you had the opportunity. Come on, brother. We do our homework. Stop playing, man. <laughs> So we know you had this opportunity to work with these young high school students to become prom king. Yeah. And, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And I don't know about you, brother, if, but if I was a teenager right now, I would be losing my mind. My college student, my daughter, is losing her mind because she won't be going back to school physically. She's going to be going to school virtually. So what advice do you have for teens who are dealing with low self-esteem images and issues that they're faced with? My advice to teenagers who are going through the low um, self-esteem, let's just call it what it is, depression. Yeah. Uh, uh, Just just locked in. I got an 18-year-old son, and and, and I'm watching the signs of, you know, potential depression, like clean your room, like do this and Mm -hmm. do that. And and my, my... advice is that you have to challenge yourself mentally because that's what you're missing. You're missing two things. You're missing the mental challenge and you're missing the social challenge. And you have to challenge yourself mentally. You have to challenge yourself socially and I might add physically. You have to do that and you have to be intentional in finding ways to do it. If I got to kick you out the house and make you walk around the block, Every single day, I will. I will be, parents, listen to me. You have to be intentional and disruptive in their routine. If you, if a teenager breaks down into a simple mundane routine, that is not a good sign. You have to be intentional. Get up, go for a walk. Hey, let's go over over our cousin's house. Let's do this. Let's give them other ways to get that dopamine fixed instead of the video games and other things that that they could be getting into because of boredom, okay? Be, you have to be the disruptor because, listen, you have to be the, you, you, you have to be the disruptor 
to create a backfire to this major disruption. Okay, so you have to create a backfire in their life to be like, okay, wow, mom, thank you for that. Wow, that was cool, a Snickers bar. Wow, this is this. Wow, this is that. And even if you don't touch all the spots, they'll look at you in appreciation and say, you know what? I know you don't fully understand, but you tried. You tried. And that right there touches my heart. Thank you for trying. And that's all we can do, man. Yeah. So. How was your experience uh, with MTV show made? How, what was that like? You know what? Surprisingly, it was more real than I thought. I thought it was going to be all scripted out and blah, you know. No, man, he, they literally turned me loose on this guy. And I <laughs> had the task of, of, of convincing the world who he was. And so I said, like, you know what? Yes, I know you feel that you should, it's okay to dress a certain, but we're always selling. You're always selling. But that was the phrase. You're always selling. Who are you? You got to sell your teachers. You got to sell people around you. You got to sell your potential girlfriend. You got to sell your boss. You got to sell the mailman. You are always selling. So therefore, the dress, the attitude, the confidence, it has to exude from you. And that's what we worked on from day one till he was a prophet. Who are you selling? Love well, we thank you for elevating and, and lifting that, that young person up, man. It goes to show not only are you able to engage young people, but you're also able to engage, uh, not only are you able to engage adults, but you're also able to engage young people, which is not easy. So yeah. Sean, how can my listeners get a copy of your book? Uh, and then how could they get in contact with you if they want to work with you, if they want to talk with you, uh, if they want to be coached by you? Okay, so two options on the book, okay? Uh, you can go to Amazon, you can purchase a hard back copy, or you can go to seanharper.co, S-H-A-W-N Harper, seanharper.co, uh, and you can download a free digital copy of the book. It's yours. It's no problem. Uh, website is seanharper.org. Um, please uh, check it out. I have tons of videos on there, tons of updates. And my Instagram, this is this is this is my selfish thing right here, is Sean Harper Speaker. And the reason why it's so selfish, because I got a college niece and she's like, you only know, have, you know, few thousand Instagram followers. I'm like, ah, I'm like wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so Sean Harper uh, Speaker, like me on Instagram. That's it. Sean, what impact do you want to leave on the world? Um, I want to change the trajectory of millions of people and them not know it was me. Well, Sean Harper, former NFL player, now turned inspirational and motivational speaker. Uh, we, I thank you for joining me in the bombshell. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. But before you leave, sure. my favorite part of the show is called the Super Bomb Questions, where I get a chance to ask you some different questions that my audience members all love and laugh and appreciate. At the okay. end. So we, you ready? Go for it. All right, so we got to respond as quickly as possible. It's not okay. called the super slow. It's called the super fast. All right, okay. so here we go, Sean. What is your favorite word? Paradigm. Okay. Uh, what brings you to tears of joy? Um, success of others. Winning of others. Okay. What brings you to tears of sorrow? Uh, people who are short-sighted and myopic. What's your favorite quote or Bible or scripture verse? Wow. Um, Proverbs. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. No, sorry. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct thy path. And Sean will be hoping Bible verse, summer Bible book camp verses for anybody that wants to know about that. <laughs> <Just play. laughs> yes. what's, your, what's your spirit animal? Oh, man. Um, bear. What's your superpower? Ooh, seeing the unseen. What do you wish you had more time to do? Think and plot. What deceased person would you want to meet and to get advice from? Jesus? <laughs> what is the book or books that you've given away most as a gift and why? Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Motes. Uh, because if you can change your self-concept, you become the thermostat, not the thermometer.
What's the best or worthwhile investment, most worthwhile investment that you've ever made? It could be money, time, energy, et cetera. Whoa. Um, my beautiful queen. Marrying my wife for over 20 years. Yeah, yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Walk us through your morning routine. Outside of the biological things you do, what's your morning routine look like? I'm up between, uh, between four and five o'clock in the morning, meditating. Um, get in a breakfast, I'm hitting the gym, and I'm plotting on how I can take over the known world. <laughs> oh, and my prayer time, my spiritual warfare. Yeah. If you were in the Mr. America talent competition, what would your talent be? My talent would be uh, spoken word. Spoken word. I love it. Well, as I told you all, Sound Bombers, you were in for a treat. NFL, former NFL player turned motivational, inspirational speaker. Sean Harper brought it just like I said he would. Check him out. Follow him on all his social media. Sean, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. And I also want to thank my amazing, amazing engineer, Alexander Block, my super duper producer, Nicole Klimpaka, and all of you for listening. I cannot do this without you. If you want to know more about me, go to drlds.com. I want to encourage you to do something for someone other than yourself today. You know, some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess, but you have been listening to Sound Bombing. Take care and peace.